Hey guys, and welcome to Amateur Sports TV and Radio. This is our first Extra Time segment on soccer. I'm joined by Hector Vergara. I'm Mahith Kamaj, of course, the president of MSA. And, you know, we're going to be talking today about some of the upcoming events this month, as well as some personal achievements from Hector. This is going to be a monthly type of thing. We're hoping to be back in August just to review each month and what's happening in soccer in Manitoba as you know things are starting to really kick off these days. Of course, it is the summer months and there are some big events that we're going to be leading up to in the coming years, of course. Uh, it's not going to be here, but Canada is co-hosting the FIFA World Cup in about seven years' time, so all the provinces are prepping for that as well as uh, the start of Canadian Premier League and all that. You know, Everybody's playing their part now. But Hector, thank you so much for being the first guest on the show. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I better correct you now in the sense that I'm not the president of Matthew oh, Soccer. I'm the executive director. Okay. That way the president would get upset. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff going on and I uh, appreciate you guys doing this with us. It's uh, an opportunity for us to uh, get out to the public and, uh, and let them know what's going on. Of course, starting on a personal note, you have just been inducted into the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame for your glittering refereeing career. I mean, what kind of, you know, I mean, how did you find out about that and what does it mean to you? Well, they uh, they called me last Thursday and told me that I couldn't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they said to keep it a secret because we're going to do a media release on uh, on Monday for which uh, right. I was invited to bring uh, the family. So, uh, yeah, the whole entire family was there and uh, it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you, you don't, uh, and I keep telling this to everybody, you, you know, I, you get involved in sport. You, I got involved in, in, in playing and officiating because I enjoy the game. Mm -hmm. uh, a way of staying connected. Uh, when you start, you never dream of anything like being at uh, right. a FIFA official or being at right. a World Cup or any national mm -hmm. competitions uh, or never never mind thinking about being a Hall of Famer and, mm -hmm. and stuff like this. So uh, for me, it was more about uh, just enjoying the game and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and giving back to it. And unfortunately, although I was a, a decent player, <laughs> uh, I would say I, 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 I did score a few goals in my time and won some scoring championships and, and, and things like this and uh, in competitions that I participated I was never a player that was going to make the national team of course um, yeah. and I realized that at a young age and uh, but I did see the opportunity that instead of working at McDonald's and running the paper <laughs> route at that mighty age that's what people used to do yeah uh, you know I, I wanted to uh, to earn some money and I started mm -hmm. refereeing at the, the very young age of about 15 16 years old and and once you start, once I started, and people saw some talent, and uh, ended up going to some difficult competitions, did, doing difficult games, and and I was successful doing it, and I stuck with it, and uh, and I got bitten by the bug, as they said, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I became a, an, an official, and uh, I got to be um, at the international level at a fairly young age, one right. of the the youngest one ever in Canada to meet, reach FIFA at 26, and uh, immediately participated in uh, FIFA competitions and. Uh, uh, the rest of it is history, as they say, you know, it's uh, lots, lots of opportunities. Right, so, I mean, your refereeing career, as you mentioned, has, uh, has gone to such great heights uh, before you, of course, uh, decided to sit back on that. But, I mean, what's the, what's the greatest game that you think you've refereed? What's most, you know, a high-end game that you've uh, been a part of? Well, I've, I've done uh, Club World Championship Finals. Um, okay. uh, Sao Paulo versus Liverpool, which is a, a, a story that we could talk for hours in itself. But um, <laughs> and I also been involved at the Olympic Games and the World Cups. Uh, so over my career, I was able to uh, participate in 11 FIFA uh, championships or World Cups, uh, under 17s, under 20s, Olympics, uh, Confederations Cup. Uh, I, I did all the competitions. Uh, funny enough, the only competitions I never ever did was the Pan American Games. Okay. Um, and it wasn't because I wasn't appointed. I was actually appointed to the 1989 Pan American Games, which happened to be in Winnipeg. Right. Uh, and I was uh, unfortunately at that time working for the Pan American Games as an employee. And I couldn't get the time off because I was uh, busy uh, essentially 24 hours a day mm -hmm. uh, sleeping. I actually slept only three hours a day for 16 days in a row. Oh, wow. uh, during the Pan American Games here in Winnipeg, and there was right. an impossibility to uh, to to officiate at the same time. Right, so yeah. that's the only uh, real uh, international appointment that I ever declined um, for good reason, I suppose. Uh, but all the other competitions at a FIFA and Concacaf level, including uh, the Gold Cup, um, I participated in and, and was very successful at it. And uh, and uh, you know, to, to pick one game or one competition is extremely yeah. difficult. <laughs> I've been asked the question many times: of What's the most difficult game I've done, or what's the most uh, interesting game I've done? And there've been so many uh, yeah, because okay. of the fact that uh, being at the World Cup and 
Uh, I was the only referee, for example, in 2002 that did six games at the World Cup in 2002, right. Korea, Japan. Uh, I did uh, semifinals in 2006 and third and fourth place finals, and I did the same thing in 2010. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's been um, quite the ride, to mm -hmm. say the least. I've, I've been over 50 countries around the world because of soccer. So right. I've been uh, and and a little bit Pan Am games. Uh, so I, I've been very fortunate. I've been uh, very, very, very fortunate to have had the career I had. Yeah. So I mean, uh, when I when I was growing up, I was uh, the one. I mean, I've been a football fan m my whole life essentially. But I mean, the one tournament that really kicked it off for me was that 2010 FIFA World Cup in South Africa. That was when I was about 11 years old, and um, you know, when that tournament you know came, it's just that's when I fell in love with the game. And you know, that fourth place game, that was when Diego Forlan scored that. Uh, the, the one where he just hit it off the ground and just passed Manuel Neuer and you know that's just a thing that you were involved in that is such like you know it's it's kind of surreal for a kid growing up in Winnipeg to know that somebody in the community was such a big part of a game like that I mean I mean you know how, how does it feel to you know reach out to a younger generation like myself and others well you know part of what I uh, what I try to do nowadays is actually mentor young referees um, mm -hmm. I've, I retire from refereeing uh, uh, in, in uh, when I turned 45 because of the age limits that FIFA had at that time no longer they have that but they had it at that time and uh, and ever since then I would been involved either on referees committees or CONCACAF referee committee FIFA referees committee I've been involved as a mentor I've been involved as a coach of referees and, and instructing referees at the highest levels but I really truly enjoy doing the mentoring at the young ages and and uh, myself and an ex FIFA referee in Winnipeg Willie Leila many many years ago started what we call the FIFA club and that's where the next generation of better referees in Manitoba came from. Uh, we unfortunately had to stop that for a while. And then now, uh, recent years ago, I started the prospects group for, for referees with other, other colleagues in, in Manitoba. And, uh, and we've been able to educate younger referees and hopefully keep on educating them to make sure that they become really good quality referees in Manitoba and be able mm -hmm. to have an impact in the game. Uh, so I, I find that really enjoyable. It's, it's kind of funny that you say that you're so young when you're actually at, uh, watching that World Cup because yeah. of that, uh, that was kind of the end of my career yeah. already. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I ended up staying on the list for another year and finished doing my last game and, uh, in the U.S. British, British Virgin Islands on the 11th, 11th of 11th. And that's actually mm -hmm. the last international match <laughs> I ever officiated in, in, in a cow pasture in the middle mm -hmm. of the Caribbean and uh, with the... Uh, one of my one of my best friends as a referee from Canada, and uh, uh, so it went full circle. You know, I started mm -hmm. doing games in the Caribbean, and I ended up doing my last game in the Caribbean. But yeah. uh, uh, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's I, I find it really enjoyable to give back to the game and to the young referees. And I have now kids that play the game, and uh, and they they always. Uh, they always call it a teaching moment with Hector uh, <laughs> because whenever I go watch a game, if I have an opportunity to speak to the referee, I will speak and, uh, and give him some pointers uh, possibly for them to, to, to get better and improve and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and because it's not easy for them. It's, 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 it's uh, something that I experienced when, mm -hmm. when we started is that the amount of um, unfortunate abuse that happens from coaches and parents and players is what actually is uh, having a huge impact on, on referee shortages in the course, world yeah. not just in Manitoba and not just in Canada but in the world mm -hmm. and then we all play a part in that whether it's us as uh, mentors or whether it's as parents or mm -hmm. coaches uh, or players and, uh, and at the end then we have to realize that we we need referees in the game in order to have games right mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's like you can't have games without players you can't have proper games without referees right. and coaches so uh, it's important for us to all realize that we play a role in that and that uh, and that uh, it is after all at our level in Manitoba we're talking about recreational mm -hmm. soccer we're talking about improving the game and right. being part of something that is wonderful and and enjoying it and it should be enjoyable for everybody not just for some of us and not others right so but it's difficult it's, it's, it's uh, unfortunately uh, that's the way it is for referees and uh, we try to help them as much as we can at the, at the younger ages mm -hmm. and now you know officiating is sort of coming into the spotlight in football because of the introduction of VAR. Of course, we don't have that at local levels even, you know, at the Canadian Premier League, they don't have that yet, but in international football, they're integrating it now into most leagues. And, you know, now the officials, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's more pressure or less pressure, but do you think that makes it, like the VAR makes it easier or maybe even more difficult for a referee now? No, I think sometimes uh, if you're not used to VAR, and, and I've had the experience of training uh, the VAR, ref the, the referees who are going to do VAR for the World Cup in right. Russia. I was part of the mm -hmm. Russia crew that, uh, that assisted with the training of the referees and the VAR and so forth. And I've done courses on VAR, and I can tell you that it's not so easy. Yeah. 
uh, because uh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you're you're not used to it. Yeah, you're a referee who was referee your entire career without it. Mm -hmm. uh, where maybe your questions were your your calls have been questioned, right. um, but at the end of the day, uh, no one was going to change your mind on something because mm -hmm. you had no VAR. Right. Now the possibility of changing your mind exists. Yeah, <laughs> and the, uh, the pressure of having to go check something and. Yeah on the screen, mm -hmm. uh, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, you know, top officials in the world, uh, one of the biggest problems they've had is, uh, is having to go see something that they thought they saw and then having to realize that it's different right. uh, on the screen and having to potentially change your mind mm -hmm. on a decision. Right. Um, that for a top, top notch referee is not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, uh, it plays in your mind, mm -hmm. especially if you're not used to it. Right. Uh, and VAR is not a solution for every problem that you're going to encounter as right. an official yeah. in the game. Um, there, you still have humans who have to analyze a yeah. clip mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or an angle of view or, or a situation that happens, whether it's a penalty, not a penalty, handball, handball, et cetera, et cetera, red card, no red card. And there's also very, and what the public sometimes don't, doesn't understand is that there's only very specific situations of which you can use VAR for. Mm -hmm. It's not everything in the game. Right. Um, and even at that, sometimes uh, it slows down game a bit. Right, yeah. uh, <laughs> a bit too much for some, the liking yeah. of some. Uh, so, so it's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, I mean you saw VAR being used in the Women's World Cup. Mm -hmm. and, and that was, a, to some degree, a little bit of a disadvantage for those yeah. referees mm -hmm. because the referees in, 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 the, in the Women's World Cup, the actual referees in the middle of the pitch, only had two or three seminars to train right. for the World Cup mm -hmm. when the decision was made that potentially they would be using VAR. Um, the referees for the 2018 World Cup in Russia had two years of training right, yeah. in many competitions and many seminars in repetition and repetition mm -hmm. after repetition. So it was different yeah. um, and even then you people would argue that they still didn't get some things right mm -hmm. and they were you're right to say that that mm -hmm. you know it's because it's not the solution and it's not the solution to everything um, like you said it's uh, it's gonna be a, a long time before it gets yeah. to the level that we deal with yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. and maybe never yeah it's very expensive yeah. uh, to do so even professional environments are gonna have a, a tough time and mm -hmm. You've seen it in England, you've seen it in Germany where they started and had to stop and mm -hmm. it didn't yeah. quite work the way it's supposed to work. Right. And so there is a, a quite a um, strict protocol that has to be followed mm -hmm. as you train uh, the organizations that are going to use it on, on how to use it. Right. So there's even, uh, there's even courses for that and uh, criteria they have to meet and, uh, and visits they have to have with different uh, technical experts around the world. So. It's quite the it's quite the process. Mm -hmm. And going back uh, to a personal note, I mean, now you're executive director. You said so, but I mean, to go from a referee to that, I mean, what was the transition like for you? And you know, I mean, I'm assuming that it was entirely new to you when you started, you know, making your way up the hierarchy. Well, I've I've started refereeing when I was 16 years old, um, and I became international when I was 26. I started going to competitions. I was um, obviously being. Uh, being the executive director of Metro Soccer Association is not related to being a referee. Yeah. Um, uh, I became a, a referee because I enjoyed it and it was a hobby of mine. And while I was a referee, I had other jobs. Uh, and uh, only it was only 15 years ago that I came to the Metro Soccer Association. Well, I've been refereeing for a long time mm -hmm. at that time. And some people might have thought that when I came to the Metro Soccer Association, I was about to retire from refereeing, yeah. but <laughs> that was not going to be the case. Uh, I, I was just kind of in the middle of my international career. Um, so it's it's. It's been helpful, though, it, be, being, uh, being able to participate um, in uh, world-class competitions around the world, being able to see other organizations, how they operate, how they run, how they treat volunteers, how they mm -hmm. deal with volunteers, how they deal with staff, uh, how do they operate with only a small amount of staff or a big amount of staff, and how do they, uh, you get to see uh, countries that live and breathe football versus a country like ours that has many, many sports and right. many opportunities mm -hmm. for uh, young athletes to participate, for coaches, for referees, many options. Uh, all of those experiences help you to carry out your role as an executive director of organization much better than if you didn't have that experience. So right. I, I'm grateful for uh, for the support of the Manitoba Soccer Association as I proceeded with my career as a referee. And at the same time, I think in Manitoba, Soccer, the province of Manitoba, um, the game of soccer has benefited tremendously by having that experience that I bring back to the table uh, because of, of those uh, of those opportunities that I had to travel the world and see many things. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, now for MSA, I mean, we're in the peak of the summer months. I mean, we're about a third through July. And, you know, all, as you mentioned before we started, all the leagues are in, in progress now. But what are some of the events that we can look forward to this month and maybe towards the end of the summer as well? Well, uh, obviously, uh, all competitions for uh, Manitoba Major Soccer League, Winnipeg Women's Soccer League, Manitoba Senior Soccer League, um, uh, the Winnipeg Youth Soccer Association, and, and obviously our member regions outside um, are, are all competing. Um, mm -hmm. they're, in, they're in the middle of the competitions for the summer. Um, there is some breaks for the recreational side of things uh, that have taken place when they play in May, May and June. Um, some teams are traveling at this time of year. Mm -hmm. They travel to tournaments and things like this. So it's a very, very busy time for, mm -hmm. for organizations, for clubs, for leagues and, and, and coaches, referees and players, parents who are probably mixing <laughs> travel tournaments with vacation yeah. and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and a lot of planning goes into that as well. Uh, so all of that is ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, obviously, uh, we at the Manitoba Soccer Association have already started uh, the provincial championship competition that, uh, that started back in June with some early games uh, and is continuing on the weekends now, on Saturday, Saturdays. Um, and obviously, we have our, uh, our uh, semifinals, second leg in some cases for the youth competition and, uh, and the semifinals for the men's competition this coming uh, Saturday. Uh, July the 13th uh, at the Ralph Cantafio Soccer Complex. Um, the winners of those competitions, uh, essentially the semifinalists, will go to the finals uh, on um, July 25th for the under 15 boys and girls and under 17 boys and girls and on uh, July 27th for the senior men's and masters competition. Uh, the winners of those competitions will eventually represent, um, represent Manitoba at uh, national and regional competitions that happens in late September and in October. And uh, so everybody's very excited about uh, <laughs> about you know the pressures of winning in, right, in a yeah. competition like this mm -hmm. and uh, and having fun with it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's a great experience for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they all prepare all year long for this competition mm -hmm. because yeah. they want to represent the province and they're proud of doing that. And we've had some national championship uh, championship teams come from this province at, at the national level right. and both the senior men's competition and mm -hmm. youth levels. So uh, so there's uh, an opportunity for them to do well again. And we look forward to having a great competition this Saturday and, and following up to, to the Thursday and Friday with, uh, with the finals. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of you know, the growth of, of football, soccer in, in Manitoba, I mean, we of course have a professional team now just in our backyard, <coughs> Valor FC. And you know, of course, I mean, uh, there's quite a few players on the team that have gone through MSA programs and stuff like that. I, I believe there's seven or eight on the team that are from Winnipeg itself, or we're at least raised in Winnipeg. I mean, now for, for the players growing up here, I mean, how big is that for them to have, you know, some, I mean, it's just across the street from here, you know, just for them to go and see and see guys like Tyler Retardo, who is probably the same age as a lot of people in the, in the program, even the U17, and he's scoring goals in professional soccer. And, I mean, how big is that for the kids here just to see that? Well, you know what? We've been crying for a professional environment for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's uh, unfortunate that we haven't had it. Uh, unfortunately, I'm old enough to tell you that we did have a professional environment with the Winnipeg Fury. Of course, yeah. Uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. I was a product of that in the sense that uh, I officiated as a central official and as an assistant referee, fourth official in the Canadian Soccer League. And mm -hmm. uh, a professional environment is important for coaches' development, it's important for player development, it's important for referee development, it's important for the growth of the game, mm -hmm. um, administrative volunteers for everybody. Um, so to have um, the CPL and Valor FC back in, in, in to have professional environment back in the Winnipeg scene is very, very important for us and we all wanted to succeed. Yeah. Uh, because um, as you mentioned, it's, it's a carrot for the young, the young athlete that wants to, uh, wants to exceed mm -hmm. at that level yeah. uh, and, and to be able to see that something is at your doorstep. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, we have programs and we have relationships with professional environments, both uh, uh, the Vancouver Whitecaps and, 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 and they look forward to in the future having a good relationship and continued relationship with the CPL Valor FC here mm -hmm. in, in Manitoba. Um, we need those pathways. Yeah. We need university pathways for, mm -hmm. for athletes. We need uh, professional pathways and, and Canada soccer pathways in the mm -hmm. sense of uh, the opportunity that Desi Scott has had to represent Manitoba, right. represent mm -hmm. Canada at, at Olympics and World Cups. Uh, that's a dream that other girls in this province have and, and, the, and the same dream that boys in this province have to potentially uh, become a professional soccer player, whether it's directly through uh, club, MSA, uh, CPL Valor programming or 
club, MSA, right. Whitecaps program. Mm -hmm. um, whatever it is, whatever opportunity exists uh, for players in, in, in this province, we want to support and mm -hmm. we're excited that we have and, and I hope that everybody out in the community is going to continue to support right. and, and attend the games of Valor and, uh, and y you know, there'll be struggles like in any organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, sure, the, the record is in the record that we all wish it was, yeah. but, uh, but the games have been closed, they've been competitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and it's an opportunity for the community to see professional soccer, exactly. uh, and an opportunity for our athletes to s strive to to be at that level one day. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and it's going to get better and better. It, mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, everything has to start from somewhere. So yeah. um, the, the fact that we have this professional environment back in the scene in Manitoba mm -hmm. is fantastic for all of us, and, uh, and we look forward to seeing it succeed. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the one thing that uh, a lot of people see as missing now is maybe that middle link between you know the developmental stage and the professional stage of course we do have WSA Winnipeg whose games we do cover on amateur sports TV but I mean they're the ones who are essentially the sole you know providers of a semi-pro professional kind of environment mm -hmm. for the players to go in so I mean how important is it maybe to to expand that in, in the city and perhaps you know, with teams at the universities that we've lost recently, maybe bringing them back or, or finding other ways to, d you know, develop those players in that age gap between like 18 and 22. Well, the professional uh, environment is uh, is one that will also have a commitment to help the the youth environment. In of other course, words, yeah. um, if you go to Canada soccer meetings, they'll tell you that part of the reason why we have CPL in Canada mm -hmm. is because those environments are supposed to help the grassroots development. Right, yeah. So uh, there eventually, and I, I don't suspect that this is going to happen overnight because obviously right now they're worried about competition and they're worried about their first team and getting ready. But eventually those environments are, are going to help to help in, in every province, are going to have to help the grassroots development. Uh, that's going to be one avenue for, mm -hmm. for, uh, for resolving the gaps that you're talking about. Obviously, uh, we would love to see on the male side uh, the university game come back mm -hmm. to uh, also help with the fact that we have a PDL franchise in the city. Um, all these opportunities will will help the, the development of the game and development of the players. There is a program of club licensing that the clubs are supposed to be engaging in and, and will be expected to engage in in the next few years. We already started that process with standards of quality soccer. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, prof uh, provincial level one and two. And eventually some of the clubs in the city, we hope, and that will strive to be a, a youth license uh, club at the national level, uh, which means they're meeting standards and they're meeting higher level standards every time, which means the programs for the players are getting better and better and better mm -hmm. and more demanding, which means the gap starts to narrow and narrow. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there's a whole bunch of different avenues on how right. the sport can become better. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never put all my eggs in one basket because of, of the thing that uh, is so diverse and so different as to how you can progress. Right. Uh, and we all have a role to play. Uh, the clubs have a role to play, the provincial association has a role to play, the professional environments have a role to play, the universities have a role to play. Um, and, uh, and one of the things, and, and, it's, and it's very true about our, our environment, that sometimes um, we don't play nicely in a sandbox. Mm -hmm. And we don't realize the potential that we have when we actually can work together on different things. Right. And in the moment that the organizations start to work together more and more, you're going to see soccer in this province continue to grow and get better, better and better all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we all have a role to play uh, at, at every organization. And I think that uh, we're starting to realize that a bit more now. Uh, and uh, and hopefully that will help the ultimate client mm -hmm. for all of us is the child, yeah. the child that plays the game. You know, mm -hmm. the child falls in love with the game at the age of three or four or five and wants to play for the rest of their life. And, and, uh, and some of them will become professional players, some will become Olympians. Um, some will become university stars, and some of them are just going to play soccer like you and I and play for the rest of our lives, right? <laughs> yeah. we're, we're never going to make the professional environment, mm -hmm. uh, but we can contribute in a different way. Exactly. So th there is, uh, there is uh, avenues for everybody, and, uh, and I think that um, the gap eventually will get smaller and smaller with all these people and all these pieces falling into place. Mm -hmm. Of course, and uh, that was the end of our show today, but thank you so much, Hector, for, for coming on, and we'll see you again next month, of course. No problem. Looking forward to it. All right, guys. Well, that was the very first episode of Extra Time here on Amateur Sports TV. Of course, I was joined by Hector Vergara, the executive director of MSA. We will be back, we'll be, we'll, we will be back next month, my, excuse, my apologies, for another episode of this, uh, just to preview what's coming up in August. But of course, this month we have the Provincials, as well as plenty of other soccer going on in the province. But thank you guys so much for tuning in on Amateur Sports TV.